Testing, one, two, three, testing. This is God speaking. Are you paying attention?
Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Greenman. I serve as president of Regent College, and I'll be your host for tonight. Thank you for being here. I want to begin by acknowledging that Regent College and UBC is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We are privileged to be on this land where we live and work and play. Thank you for being here. It's so fun to do something that feels somewhat normal, doesn't it? After so many months of not gathering like this, uh, this is a book launch, and it's one of my delights as president of the college to say that Regent College has had many book launches over the years from our faculty, as they have been very often writers of some distinction and, and prolific authors in some cases, and the chance for every author, whether it's their first book or their tenth book or however many books, to talk about that book in public and, in a sense, launch it into discourse and discussion is always an exciting thing. It's a proud moment for us as a college to acknowledge our faculty when we do this. And so uh, welcome to that little bit of Regent College tradition that tonight represents. And I hope you have a really great time here. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how we're going to operate tonight. So our speaker, who I'll introduce in just a second, will talk to us about the ideas behind this book, the big ideas and themes and so on. And uh, he's got some PowerPoint slides to share to that effect. And then I'll ask him a couple of questions, which gives you time to think about your questions that you'd like to ask. And we do want to have those. Thank you also for those of you who are joining us tonight online with the live stream. You can send in your questions as well, and we'll pick those up and pass them along. So for those of you here in the room uh, in Regent in our chapel, then there's a couple of microphones that you would have seen at the back. And if you have a question, just pop up there and ask so that everyone can hear and we have it for the recording as well. So that's how we'll operate. So our speaker will speak, our host will ask a few questions, you'll ask some questions, and then that afterwards at the bookstore, just around the corner, there's a chance to pick up a copy of the book and I'm sure that the author would be delighted to sign it for you. Every author delights in signing books, uh, as many as possible. So. Uh, that's the order for tonight, that's what we'll be doing, and I'm really looking forward to it. So, Dr. Ross Hastings, uh, many of you would know Ross, I think virtually all of you or have met Ross. He probably doesn't need a lot of introduction, a longtime professor here at Regent and also pastor. Some of you have experienced Ross's pastoring and preaching for many years. Ross is the Sangwa Wutong Chi Professor of Theology teaches a very broad range of courses for us in our curriculum, a very versatile teacher, and is an increasingly prolific author. He's been on quite a roll in the last few years. So there's other Ross Hastings books available in the bookstore as well. I'll just mention two other ones of the last few years. Total Atonement, which is about the doctrine of the atonement, what Christ achieves on the cross, uh, and also a book on theological ethics and there's others as well in Ross's overall corpus. So uh, Ross, in just a second, we'll call you up. I just wanna say an opening prayer and then we'll be underway. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that we can gather tonight. We thank you for Regent College and its faculty and especially tonight for Ross Hastings. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you give him and the energy and strength to write a book like this and now give him clarity of thought and expression as he shares his thoughts with us and help us all, Lord, to have open minds to learn and grow tonight. And we offer this time to you for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. So let's welcome Ross Hastings. Thank you very much, Jeff. This book had an unusual birth. On a summer day in 2020, I turned the radio on between the grocery store and the cottage, and it just so happened that an oratorio called The Resurrection, composed by Handel, was playing. It's a magnificent piece. I had listened to The Messiah many times, but I'd never heard of this piece before. It suddenly lifted my spirit, and the brain cells started to come alive. And when I arrived home, I went to my desk and in 10 minutes or so wrote a 10 chapter outline of a book on the theology of the resurrection. This is the book. And the chapter titles have more or less stayed intact. So I'm grateful first to God for his gracious work in giving me the vision for this book and enabling its completion. 
I'm thankful also to Regent College for the gift of sabbatical time in which to write and for the encouragement of our dean in this regard, Paul Spilsbury. I'm also deeply thankful for Jimmy and Janet Chi and their presence here and their uh, generosity in supporting the chair of theology. I wish to express thanks also for the help of my teaching assistants, Jacob Raju and Chris Agnew. I'm grateful also to Robert Hosack and Tim West of Baker Academic for their expert editorial assistant, assistance and for the work of copy editor Melinda Timmer. My wife, Tammy, has been a huge source of emotional support during the time of writing and uh, has also helped with proofreading and welcome breaks walking around the beautiful Ladysmith area of Vancouver Island in the summers. FaceTime calls during this pandemic with our grandchildren also have brought great joy. Tammy and I both lost our spouses to cancer in 2008, so the hope of resurrection grounded in the bodily resurrection of Jesus is more than academic for us. There's a passage in the New Testament that declares the importance of the resurrection of Jesus, and there are three themes from that passage which will serve to structure my lecture tonight. 1 Corinthians 15, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but, if, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. The first chapter of this book has the heading, or could have the heading, without the resurrection there is no faith. And it is centered around this verse, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith. Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar once said, if there had been no resurrection from the dead, Gnosticism would be correct. Our whole faith depends on it. Yaroslav Pelikan's aphorism is relevant. If Christ is risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. Therefore, looking for evidence in a faith-seeking, understanding kind of way, I think is somewhat appropriate. The importance of the resurrection is confirmed eloquently by theologian Tom Torrance, who said this, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a historical happening, not of the kind that fades away from us and crumbles into the dust, but of the kind that remains real and therefore that resists corruption and moves the other way forward throughout all history to the end time and to the consummation of all things in the new creation. Jesus remains live and a real historical happening, more real and more historical than any other historical event. For this is the only historical event that does not suffer from decay and is not threatened by annihilation and illusion." C.S. Lewis, well known for his writing on the resurrection, converted through his research on the historicity of the resurrection, once said that to preach Christianity meant primarily to preach the resurrection. The historical evidence is strong, but I do want to indicate that it is not proof, as we think of it in modernity or according to logical positivism, but rather in the sense that it makes sense of all the evidence and in the sense that all alternative explanations seem unlikely. This is proof in accordance, therefore, with critical realism rather than logical positivism, but that is really how even science regards how we know what we know. Karl Popper, philosopher of science, championed falsification rather than verification as the way of knowing in science and so provided validity for properly investigated historical claims. 
And then chemist turned philosopher Michael Polanyi in his proposal about knowing in science and theology as tacit and personal reaffirmed the faith-seeking understanding epistemology of the ancient church. My emphasis in the book is not, I want to say, is not apologetics, but rather con a constructive theology of the resurrection. However, let me just mention a little of the evidence uh, with six very brief bullet points with little comment except maybe on the first. The first line of evidence for the historicity of the resurrection is the reporting. Is the reporting reliable? Bible authors arguing for the Bible may seem like circular reasoning. This, uh, this is, of course, unfair to the gospel writers, one of whom, Luke, is a very ironic and careful physician and historian, for example. What is more, these four writers agree on the major events that occurred during and around the resurrection, and in an unemotional and historically conscious way, these gospel writers describe the eyewitness accounts of the disciples and many others, and so give a dispassionate and convincing account of the historical reality that Jesus was risen. For doubters who say that the gospel records were written too many years after the fact to be reliable, New Testament critical scholar Craig Blomberg has insisted that a strong case may be made, quote, that all three gospels were composed within about 30 years of Christ's death and well within the period of time when people could check up on the accuracy of the facts that they contain. Other historical documents that are, considerable, that are considered reliable do not, do not have anything like the turnaround time that the Gospels do. The Gospel writers also frequently make statements that ground their writings in history, such as which Caesar is reigning in Rome, suggesting that they knew they were writing history and not wishful narration. The fact that there may be some, inc some inconsistencies regarding details of the four accounts, for example, the number of women at the tomb, the number of angels, location of appearances, and so on, on the one hand suggests that the authors naturally had slightly different purposes for how they used the accounts of events in their narratives. On the other hand, it confirms how recent the events were when described by the writers. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright has suggested surface inconsistencies which may make the accounts appear to be careless fiction rather constitute a strong point in favor of their early character. He goes on to say that these stories, and here I quote, exhibit exactly the surface tension which we associate, not with tales artfully told by people eager to, to sustain a fiction, and therefore anxious to make everything look right, but with hurried, puzzled accounts of those who have seen with their own eyes something which took them horribly by surprise. Critiques of the historicity of the resurrection offered by liberal historical Jesus scholars abound, guided by a presupposition against the miraculous. Most of these objections, including the notion that the resurrection does not belong in the actual narrative of the life of Jesus, but was added later by the church, arise, I think, from an unfortunate severing of history from theology. But for the sake of the skeptic, the question may be asked, what external evidence is there for the resurrection? Wilkins and Moreland state that when mutually accepted standards of historiography are applied to ancient religious records, the Jesus of history fares well historically. They suggest further that when the records of religious history are compared, such as Zoroaster, Buddha, and Muhammad, we have better historical documentation for Jesus than the founder of any other religion. Edwin Yamauchi, in particular, has provided evidence in the form of 10 writers who make references to Jesus outside of the New Testament. The second line of evidence relates to the crucifixion that preceded the resurrection, the third to the empty tomb and the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. The fourth, for me, perhaps the strongest, is the transformation of the eyewitnesses of the apostles who are timid and cowardly and afterwards are willing to be martyred for what they had seen and believed. Fifth, the Pauline witness to the appearance. And sixth, the centrality of the resurrection in the teaching of the early church. I'll just say a few words about that. With regard to the preaching of the resurrection, there is evidence from critical New Testament scholarship that it began very quickly after the resurrection event. For example, uh, James Dunn, in his book Remembering Jesus, asserts that the words of 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4, are an early Christian creed that was formalized and preached within months of Jesus' death. Paul, it is agreed, received this tradition three years after his conversion, according to Galatians 1, during a visit to Jerusalem, where he met with Peter and James. 
If, as seems reasonable, the appearance of Jesus to Paul happened about two years after Jesus' resurrection, and the tradition preceded this event, then the tradition was extant within five years of Jesus' resurrection, which is very early by the standards of ancient literature. So I think we can be confident of the historicity of the event, but that's not the point of the book. The point of the book is, what does it mean? What, what, what is the theology uh, of the resurrection? What does it have to say? And I'm going to make... Uh, the point first, that without the resurrection, there is no salvation. Its meaning is profoundly related to our salvation. As Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. So there's a salvific orientation to that. The book, um, as I've written it, has two sections. The first is on soteriology, or salvation. The second is on being, or ontology, what happens within the being of Christ that is so crucial. But even the emphasis on how the resurrection affects salvation is also ontological. The emphasis is on the being of the Son of God who became fully human so as to act vicariously for us. Salvation is accomplished in his person on the cross and in his person in the resurrection. To separate his person from his work is not just what's called the Latin heresy. It is actually to rob us of the very essence of what salvation is. Under this heading, I want to pursue, first of all, the notion that redemption accomplished has no validity. It's uh, within the field of salvation theology. Uh, we speak of redemption accomplished through the atonement and of redemption applied to our hearts uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So first, the first point is to say that without the resurrection, there is no salvation. And I want to reference that particularly to redemption accomplished. I've written a book on the atonement called Total Atonement, so there isn't a lot about the atonement in this, in this book. But there is a discussion of the atonement models and the necessity um, of the resurrection for each of the atonement models, both as ratification of the atonement and indeed, I venture to say, as part of the atonement. The resurrection is part of the atonement. For example, the model of recapitulation um, derived from Irenaeus requires a last Adam, and he needs to be a risen last Adam who overcomes the death of the first Adam. Secondly, the model Christus Victor, which is very popular right now uh, amongst uh, theologians, Christus Victor requires a conqueror, but that conqueror needs to be a risen conqueror who conquers sin and death and Satan. The resurrection is necessary. Actually, my own opinion is that Christus Victor requires Christus vicarious. So you see, for the accuser to be defeated and for death, which is his domain, to be vanquished, Christus vicarious, that is the vicarious Christ, must deal justly in the atonement of our sin. Thirdly, sacrificial models, including penal substitution theory, require also a resurrected Christ. The book of Hebrews, for example, I think, conflates the cross, the resurrection, and the ascension into one event, and all happens within sacred space. And so the crucified Jesus makes atonement in the presence of God, and then the risen Jesus, according to the book of Hebrews, sits down, but that's, that's, that's a conflation of the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. The, the, so the resurrection and ascension of Jesus is all important. Having um, made purification for our sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty and high. That includes his resurrection and his ascension, his triumphant ascension. Furthermore, res resurrection is vital, obviously, to a high priest who perpetuates our salvation in the book of Hebrews, who saves us right on to the end. He didn't merely sit down. His session in Hebrews leads to his intercession, and he's able to save us right on to the end, for he, according to the text, ever lives in the power of an endless life to make intercession. Resurrection vital to his high priestly ministry. And this, I think, has enormous repercussions for our worship as the church because Jesus, as the risen, ascended high priest, is called our liturgos. He is our lit liturgy leader. He's our worship leader. Our worship is engraced as it is caught up by the Spirit uh, in the risen Son. 
uh, to the Father. I'd like to say a lot more about that, but I won't. Let me move to second, the second sub-point here under the theme of um, without the resurrection there is no salvation and say that redemption applied also has no power apart from the resurrection. Atonement applied is very much dependent on the resurrection. We think of justification and sanctification as a summary of our salvation. And we think of those as forensic or judicial terms. But actually, both are grounded in a relational ontology. I, I would argue they are grounded on the three great unions of soteriology. That is, the unio hypostatica, the unio cum Christi, and the unio mystica. That is, the Son's union with humanity at the incarnation, our union with Christ when we are regenerated and come to faith, and the, that, the simultaneous union of every believer into the church of Christ. First, Christ's life and death and resurrection are vicarious only because of the hypostatic union. Our justification is a fait accompli pronounced over our heads because it was accomplished in his person 2,000 years ago, in his representative vicarious person. Second, our access to it by faith comes by mean of a, means of a union with the living Christ, with his humanity, and this is enabled by the Holy Spirit who regenerates us even before we believe. And justification is by faith, yes, but I want to emphasize that justification is first in Christ. Our salvation is already completed in Christ before we have faith to perceive it. Now let me focus for a moment um, on the theme of justification. Without the resurrection, there is no justification. Let me state that more positively. In light of the resurrection, we have justification and are made righteous before God. It was accomplished by Jesus in his body, dead and risen. For as Paul says in Romans chapter 4, God will credit righteousness to those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Why does the resurrection of Jesus from the dead in a body matter? It is because it is the climax and the seal of the saving work of Jesus on the one hand. As we have said, the atonement is not complete without the resurrection. And Paul makes it clear in this passage that Christ's death for our sins led to his resurrection for our justification, or is synonymous with that, you may say. This is what we call legal or forensic language around justification. The idea is that the God of justice has raised his son Jesus from the dead to ratify or endorse the atoning efficacy of his vicarious substitutionary death for sinners. In so doing, God has proved himself to be faithful to his covenant with his people in a way that I think um, the new perspective people around the atonement have expressed. His commitment to being their God and his commitment to making them his people by effecting the redemption in a way that was true to his own standards of justice. It was more, however. It was an expression of the Father's delight in the Son as a person, as a person in all of his obedience. The resurrection was a sign of the Father's delight in his offering up a sacrifice of infinite worth in his life and on the cross. The resurrection shouts that God has redeemed humanity in a righteous way. He has provided the reconciliation and redemption needed for them to be in covenant relationship with him. Of course, the mystery around this is that Jesus himself is God and man, and since the triune God is the subject of this act of resurrection, I suppose that Jesus, as the Son of God, is himself acting in his own resurrection moment. In other words, he rose again in one sense by virtue of his own authority and power. Just as Jesus on the cross in the enactment of atonement is called by Karl Barth the judge and the judged, that is, God the judge and the judged as our Savior, here in resurrection, he is both the raiser and the raised. He is both the exalter and the exalted. However, Peter's emphasis in Acts 2 and that of Paul in Romans 4.25 is on the divine action carried out upon the Son 
who became human to stand in our place, who suffered death and judgment for us. He was vindicated, he was vindicated, and humanity in union with him therefore was vindicated. And above all, the covenant faithfulness and justice of God was vindicated. So does resurrection matter? If the justification of sinful humans and the fallen creation matters, then the resurrection matters. There's been a tendency in recent evangelical theology, I think, to downplay the idea of justification as imputed righteousness, despite its roots in the Reformation. For Martin Luther and the Lutherans, the doctrine of justification was the first and chief article of the faith. And indeed, Luther spoke of it as the ruler and judge over all other Christian doctrines. Justification was entirely the work of God, and a clear distinction was kept between justification, our status before God, and sanctification, our status our state in our hearts and lives. That a clear distinction was made by Luther between faith and works. Faith was not thought of as a condition on which justification was decided as if human faith could somehow add to what Christ had accomplished. Rather, faith was considered merely to be receptive, contributing no merit at all. In fact, even as something that was merely instrumental in receiving the gift of justification, faith was itself considered to be a gift from God given by the regenerating Holy Spirit. John Calvin also kept justification distinct from sanctification, although they were inseparable for him because of union with Christ. But more and more than Luther, Calvin insisted that sanctification came along with justification. They were inseparable, both grounded in union with Christ, yet distinct from one another. Over against this, some theologians in the evangelical tradition have made the move towards conflating justification and sanctification. This is understandable, given that the church fathers, even including Augustine, as well as both the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic traditions, seem to have used these terms interchangeably as synonymous components of theosis. Some also think of sanctification as the evidence for justification, and there is some truth to that, but have thought that we are not pronounced justified until the judgment, the final judgment day is pronounced. There are definitely exceptions to this view among the Eastern Orthodox, and indeed, since Vatican II, there's been a definite recognition by the Catholic Church of justification by grace through faith. This recognition even led in 1999, after much ecumenical dialogue, to a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification by the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church. Some nuanced differences still remain with respect to the nature of faith and works and assurance, but much progress has been made in this ecumenical dialogue towards recovery of justification as a divine declaration of righteousness over those who believe because of the resurrection. Now, Karl Barth is in many ways the theologian of justification in the Reformed tradition and influential in this ecumenical dialogue. His answer to the inward turn for assurance of salvation in theologians like Schleiermacher was to point away from himself to Christ, who rose again for our justification. In fact, the point of departure for Barth's entire theology, as it, exp as it is expressed in his church dogmatics, is, as Joseph Mangina has suggested, the presence of the resurrected Jesus, the bearer of God's new creation. Not that Bart in any way minimized the importance and efficacy of the theology of the cross and its implications for our salvation and our suffering as the people of God, but there was for Bart a yes from God that in its finality would drown out the no of human sin and its consequence in creation. This Yes, was the resurrection and the justification it proclaimed, not just of humanity, but of the entire cosmos. In Karl Barth, as Trevor Hart has said, the critical article of the church is not justification as such, but its basis and culmination, the confession of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of his being and activity for us and to us and with us. It is by means of the concept of homoousios, and incarnational theology that Bart links all humanity to Christ and by means of which an objective and real justification is actualized concretely for all humans. The essential meaning of the word homoousios, 
is the sharing of substance or essence. God the Son had shared eternally in the same divine essence as the Father and the Spirit. But by means of the incarnation, as Athanasius said, the Son of God became homoousios with humanity. That's the wonder of the gospel. All that he was and all that he did as a human person, therefore he did vicariously for humanity. He could legitimately stand in our place. By a kind of Augustinian realism, Christ's life and death and resurrection were legitimately vicarious for us. Grounding justification in the homoousios concept means that who Christ is, is our justification. God's yes over humanity and indeed over creation was pronounced in the person of the risen Christ. And what transpired in his death and resurrection affects not just our forensic status. As Bart said, it is a reality transition, a new ground for being, a new ontology. In other words, it is ontological. Our justification is a matter of human being. And it also entails the notion of covenant. So Bart takes being and creation and he unites it with covenant. The first Adam was brought into covenant relationship with God and neither he nor the nation of Israel to which he gave rise could fulfill that covenant. But God in the last Adam provided for himself his own covenant partner. And in sum, it is the primacy of the incarnate Christ in uniting creation and covenant that paves the way for this Bartian doctrine of justification. The pronunciation of God over creation was, it is good. But by Bart, that's not deemed to refer to aesthetics, as it might in Jonathan Edwards, for example, nor even to its consonance with some divine blueprint. Rather, Bart maintains that the creation is declared right insofar as it is capax infinity, able to be taken up by God in the incarnation and brought concretely to its telos in fulfillment of the covenant. This divine assessment of creation and the new humanity in Christ thus anticipates the ontological aspect of justification that for Bart then determines the forensic aspect. God as creator and Lord of the covenant has a right over his creatures and covenant partners. And in Christ, the elect man, God establishes the right of humans to existence by putting to death that which contradicts God's purpose in creation, replacing it with the new creation. It's common for the triumphant word of Christ on the cross, it is finished, to be interpreted in a juridical or judicial way. The work of making atonement for the guilt of our sin was over. While not negating this, it is possible to see it first as a declaration that the old humanity was finished with. A new humanity would begin in the resurrected Christ. That ontological reality is the grounding of the forensic one. The key issue is that the existence of this new humanity as good is not one of potential or as if, but one of actuality. Bart's point is that justification as ontological means that we are not merely treated as if we were just. We actually are just in God's eyes. And central in Bart's theology of ontological justification is his location of this justification in the history of the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, and then secondarily in the histories of individual men and women. Bart develops this thought from his Christological doctrine of election, the election of God to be for humanity in eternity past. According to Bart's accounting, in the eternal counsels of God, the Son is the person and the Godhead elected to become human, to stand in humanity's place. And by a wonderful exchange, that phrase runs throughout all of church history, a wonderful exchange, he replaces our guilt and corruption and death with forgiveness and cleansing and life. Thus, our identity and being are determined by our relationship to this man, the Deus Incarnandus, who became the Deus Incarnatus, in such a way that his, as Bart says, his particular history is the prehistory and post-history of all of our individual lives. Actually, that was Trevor Hart speaking of Bart. This is why the source of our assurance of salvation is not ultimately how our souls are doing, how our affections are ordered or disordered, how our actions are ethical or not, or generally how we're feeling. These things have their place, but our source of assurance ultimately that we are righteous in God's sight is the risen 
righteous Christ in whom all has been made right. Over all who are in Christ, God has said yes. Now, of course, this makes all pursuit of godliness in the process of sanctification to be something delightful and enjoyable, and the word is evangelical. And by, by evangelical, I don't mean the evangelicals. I mean evangelical in terms of the meaning of good news. This is good news. Um, pursuit of, of sanctification becomes evangelical, not legal. This means that the ordering of our affections and the purifying of our actions, which needs to happen in sanctification, is not an ongoing performance to secure the yes of God, His approval. We live in that approval. We bask in His complacent delight in Christ and therefore in us. In sum, the resurrection is the ontological foundation for justification. And what Christ did for us is dependent on who He is, on what took place within His person, and given that He became one with us, this then determined who He is for us. Another way to say that is the history of His being, ordo historia, becomes the history of our being, the salvation of our being, the ordo salutis. The ordo historia becomes the ordo salutis. Let me now speak very briefly of sanctification. Um, and I will be brief on this one because um, I write a lot about it in the book, and so I want to just sort of uh, hold the carrot for you um, to, to, to read about this. Um, there are six dynamics that are the consequence of um, the gospel and the gospel of the resurrection. And whereas Karl Barth neglected sanctification in his obsession with justification, the person I most go to for a discussion of sanctification is John Calvin. He keeps justification and sanctification together. He calls them the duplex gracia, the two graces, um, the twin graces that flow from unio Christi, union with Christ. Justification is righteousness imputed, our juridical status before God in light of our being in Christ, and sanctification is righteousness imparted. Jonathan Edwards would even say righteousness infused within us using a Thomistic category, our actual state as believers. So my emphasis on this book on sanctification is on lived union and communion with the once dead and now living Christ. And so actually the first, um, the first theme under sanctification is union, our union with Christ. Um, and how our union with Christ is our union with him in death and resurrection, leading to our mortification and vivification, leading to spiritual practices associated with those two things. Um, in, 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 that, that are really helpful, I think, in our Christian lives. Um, I think the most crucial part of sanctification, however, and for this I draw on the great tradition, is to understand it as participation in Christ. It's union in Christ. It's not self-effort. It's enabling by the Holy Spirit who applies the death and resurrection of Christ to us. And it's to draw on the rich wells of Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant forms of theosis, in other words. The second dynamic, which makes sanctification evangelical and not legal, is the role that the resurrection plays in that ontological and forensic sense that I was talking about uh, just a moment ago. Um, I, I will mention the third dynamic is the role of Irenaean recapitulation model um, and what the resurrection of the last Adam and all in him means for the telos of sanctification as the recovery of what it means to be human. I think often we think of holiness and being fully human as separate, but I think the biblical um, narrative would suggest that the telos of our sanctification is to recover what it means to be fully human, and uh, there's so much one could say about that. Uh, the fourth dynamic is to see resurrection as the reaffirmation of creation and its moral order as the ground for evangelical ethics in a manner in which I followed the work of Oliver O'Donovan, Resurrection and the Moral Order, uh, need I say that it's vital at this time of the church's history um, for us to be, to be articulate and to be aware of what the tradition and what the text has to say about areas, for example, like, like sexual ethics and, um, and things like racism. And I would argue that the resurrection of Jesus Christ and its reaffirmation of a, a moral order within us um, and pursuing evangelical ethics in, in light of the gospel and in participation with Christ has all kinds of things to say about sexual ethics and about 
uh, racism and, and all kinds of things. Um, the resurrection of Jesus as the new human needs to speak to us and needs perhaps to speak to Putin right now um, because nationalism is so dangerously, pres dangerously present and sadly even supported by members of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, in Russia. The fifth dynamic is the ecclesial dynamic and the sixth is the vicarious humanity and high priesthood of Christ. Um, but time is going on, so let me move to the third um, and last point about the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and this is, this is a bit of a mouthful, uh, and this actually summarizes a number of the chapters of the book. Without the resurrection of Jesus, we have no resurrection of the body, we have no new creation, we have no sense of what vocation means, we have no grounding for Christian ethics, we have no validation of the sciences, and we have no validation of the arts. And how I get to that, of course, uh, would take perhaps a while to get through. But the text here, going back to the third text uh, from 1 Corinthians 15 that relates to this, but if he did not raise him, sorry, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Um, and, of course, the inference, inference here is that we do indeed have life if he did rise again from the dead in all aspects of it. And I love how 1 Corinthians 15 climaxes, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. That's a triumphant moment in that text. And in light of that, we have, we have so much. And having been through two years of COVID now, and now in the midst of a menacing war in Ukraine, humanity is facing the specter of death. And we need to live into the hope of the resurrection of the dead in light of his resurrection. The grounding of our resurrection of the future, again, is ontological. Christ's participation in humanity and his conquering of death for humanity is the reason that all in him will rise again. And of course, there's all kinds of questions surround these eschatological matters of the resurrection of the dead. So for example, what kind of body will the resurrection body be? And what is its relation to the mind or, or the soul? And uh, following what seems clear about the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that we are resurrected in union with him, it seems clear to me that the post-mortem body of every believer will be continuous with the pre-mortem body with respect to identity. There is some discontinuity also, as is evident from the nature of Jesus' body um, when he rose again, and as indicated by Paul's reference to it being a spiritual body. But the thing I want to emphasize, I don't have all the answers, and, and uh, I, I do offer some um, in terms of how the soul and the body uh, relate in the time between a death and the resurrection. Um, and uh, you can read about that in my book. But I just want to emphasize this. Resurrection, as with our salvation now, is, is a participation, again, in the resurrection of Christ. Catherine Tanner says, So for us, life in Christ brings not just created goods, but divine attributes such as imperishability and immortality, which are ours only through the grace of Christ and the resurrection of our bodies. When the fire of our own lives grow cold we come to burn with God's own flame. And Hunter Ruffin says the resurrection of the body and the meaning of that promise is found first and foremost in the embodied life. The meaning of the bodily resurrection is found in the moment that we let go of our attempts to construct our own identity outside of the identity gifted to us by God. And it becomes real to us in this life when we are able to find the courage to let go of the possession of self-identity and to begin claiming the identity that comes from God as pure gift. It is in that moment that we begin to live into the new creation made real in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. So just as we are persons in relation now, we shall be persons in relation there, profoundly dependent and participating uh, in the life of Christ. Now very briefly, with the resurrection, I've argued that we have no impetus for creation care, and with it, we have every impetus. The resurrection of Jesus is the reaffirmation of creation, of the new creation. His resurrection in a physical body is the reaffirmation of the new creation. God is committed to his creation. The creation narratives tell us that creation was good. It was not yet perfected, though, until the coming of the last Adam, who took away the no over creation, 
and in him creation has God's yes over it, and we must, as the church of the new creation, in fulfillment of a cultural mandate that has never been rescinded, do all that we can to overcome global warming and steward the earth that God has given us. We have no science without the resurrection. Resurrection, along with the incarnation, signals that matter matters, and that the particularities of matter matter. Science flourished in a Christian civilization. I want to say that we cannot, as image bearers in the last Adam, care for creation if we don't know how it works. And so I urge every one of us to become curious about science, even if we can't have a career in science. And lastly, we have no arts. This is an, this is an extension of the fact that matter matters and that it has beauty, a beauty that I think is ultimately a reflection of the risen, glorified Lord in all his beauty and the glory of the triune God. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So, are we good here? We're good here. We're good here. Okay, so thank you very much, Ross. And uh, this is your chance to think of some questions you'd like to ask. Well, I ask a couple of questions, okay? So start thinking, if you haven't thinking. Send them in online. Uh, we've got ways to uh, accommodate those questions and bring them forward. Um, so I want to come back to what you were just saying about creation and the idea of resurrection related to creation and creation care and, and so on. Um, in one of the gospel um, accounts, Jesus, the, the resurrected Jesus, fairly soon upon being discovered, is mistaken for a gardener. Is that significant? So in other words, say more about this relationship between resurrection and new life and, in a sense, the first life of, of creation and the created order. What is, what's the relationship you're talking about? I don't remember which gospel that is, but it, I think it does have significance. Um, we do recognize that in the beginning, humanity was placed in a garden, um, and that uh, perhaps Jesus, uh, perhaps the reference to Jesus as a gardener is somehow recapitulating that and pointing to here's the last Adam, and he's, he's, he's the one who will uh, reaffirm creation and bring into effect the new creation um, and uh, you know, I think the whole narrative of Scripture taken together would urge us towards uh, caring for creation. And sometimes I feel as though the gospel is preached in our churches uh, in a Gnostic way. You, we want you to be saved in order that you might go to heaven. And it's nice to go to heaven, and it's great to have eternal security and assurance of that. Don't get me wrong. But the truth is um, that we have been redeemed not to escape out of creation, but to fulfill uh, the fullness of our humanity in creation. We are, uh, we, 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 there, there is no divide between redemption and creation. Redemption is the redemption of creation. It's not the redemption out of creation. And so I would say in anticipation of the fullness of the new creation, the uh, people of the church need to be gardeners. Um, <laughs> but pretty much all I know how to do in a garden is weed. But, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, the, the, there, there are others in my family who are good gardeners. And I think, it is, uh, I think it's more metaphorical in terms of care for this earth and appreciate its beauty. Maybe. Mm, thank you. Well, thorns and thistles show up fairly soon in the story as well, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. weeding is very important. Um, folks, that was a joke. Come on. Um, so uh, the, other, the other thing you said I wanted to follow up on is you said the thinking of your questions now. Yes, are you? Yep, good. Um, the, the, you said the telos of our sanctification, in other words, the destiny or the goal of our, of our sanctification is to become fully human. Yes. There's a lot in that little sentence. Do you right. want to just take a minute and explain what, what does that mean? That might be new news to people, this idea of becoming fully human. Yes, because I think perhaps maybe when we hear the word human, we think of all our faults and failings, our depravity, our propensity for selfishness and sin. What I mean by human in that, in that sense is the humanity that was created by God. Um, we, th there was then a fall, uh, but Christ comes as the last Adam. I think always, you know, God's first thoughts are his last reveal. Jonathan Edwards said that. And so, he, uh, you know, we look at Adam and we say, well, that's, that's God's final thought. And that was never God's final thought. His final thought was always the last Adam. And, um, and, and so... 
all that it meant to be human for the first Adam is recapitulated in Jesus as the last Adam. And, and, and so what does that mean? It meant to be in relationship with God. It meant to fulfill the cultural mandate to recognize that God is at work in our work, uh, to raise families and to be in communities, whether we're married or not, to, be, to live in community. All, all, all of those things, I think, um, is, is what it means to be human. But I think there's another dynamic or, or nuance to that phrase, and that is um, sometimes uh, in the history of the church and sometimes maybe in certain seasons of our own life, we've thought as sanctification as something by means of which I want to escape being human rather than recognizing that to be a healthy human person who delights in their work, a healthy human person who goes for walks and takes in God's creation, uh, all of that, that is actually holy. Um, it's, you know, one, doesn't, one isn't just holy when one uh, is taking the Eucharist, although that's, that's obviously crucial. One is not just holy when one is reading one's Bible. Uh, a person is holy in the fullness of their humanity that God delights in, and we can live into that in light of who Christ is by the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Big, big ideas here. There is a question up at the back. Yes. Hey. Is it on? Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, good. Hi, Ross. Um, so my question is, you know, you talk about Jesus being, you know, the, the last Adam and his resurrection um, is the redemption from the first Adam. But right now there are debates about the historical Adam, if he was actually real or not. So um, if, if the historical Adam is not real and, you know, we, we can talk about that as a whole other topic, does that affect then the effects of the resurrection? I think everybody on the, both sides or, or many sides of this issue is that was there a historical Adam would say there was a historical Adam. It's how you understand who that historical Adam was. Um, and so one school of thought would say it is a literal single person and others would say it was humanity at the, at the time. Um, and you have uh, people in the discussion who are concordists who try to make sense of um, the, the uh, historical Adam and the account of uh, and the account of Genesis bringing them together, perhaps in ways that recognize that once uh, humanity had reached a certain point of development, then God crowns a certain person with with the image of God. And others who say, you know, one doesn't need to do that. That's not what that text is doing, um, and, and and that's not the genre of that text. So, but either way, um, there is, I think, no problem in saying. Historical Adam, as understood, in whatever way you understand it, um, is, is the subject of, of our, our redemption. Do you want to follow that up, or are you, you can come back again if you need me. Over to this microphone. Hi, Go Ross. Um, I wanted to uh, ask if you could talk a little bit about what the presence of the scars on Jesus' resurrection body um, tells us about the promise of healing. It's huge. I write a chapter on that in Missional God, Missional Church. The scars in the, um, in, in the body of Jesus, post-mortem, risen, are hugely expressive. I've argued in that book that his presence there as the risen one is, and, and how he speaks to his disciples is perhaps evocative for John of the preaching of the word, whereas his presence with scars in his hands is perhaps evocative of the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. But beyond that, I think there's something powerfully uh, powerful about that um, which I didn't uh, get into, there is something of that in this book, that at the right hand of the Father is someone who has scars in his hands, and therefore he is sympathetic with our suffering. He's not isolated from our suffering. Um, the book of Hebrews uh, uh, talks beautifully in, in Hebrews chapter 4 about um, Jesus, the Son of God, as the title um, in, 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 in the summary at the end of chapter 4, where Jesus is evocative of his humanity, son of God, of his deity, and our high priest is someone who is both sympathetic and strong. Um, so I think there's something powerful ontologically in that uh, evidence, in, in, in that reality of his hands and side being scarred. Um, it, uh, because you would think, well, shouldn't he have had this perfect body? 
Um, and that's a very platonic and, shall I say, Gnostic concept, whereas he's got a body that reflects his history. And perhaps, too, our bodies will in some way reflect our history. At the same time, I want to say that in light of the redeeming work of Christ and his resurrection, all illness, all disabilities will be gone. I think, I think that's part of the hope of the resurrection. Thank you. Great. George. Question up here, George Guthrie. Ross, thank you for your uh, excellent lecture. Um, we live in a time of, uh, that is in great need of hope. It's a longing uh, on the part of humanity, and I think in some ways you see the longing for being something more in things like transhumanism and even popular culture with superhero movies. You know, there's this longing to be able to fly or mm -hmm. pass through walls and do all these kind of things. Um, it, it seems to me that a lot of times, though, in, in our speaking of the gospel, we don't follow the pattern of the early church in making resurrection an aspect. I mean, resurrection was very central, if we're reading Acts, to the proclamation of the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess my question is, how, how might we incorporate uh, resurrection hope as an aspect of the good news? As, as we're talking to people just in our... Uh, neighborhoods, cultural surroundings, that kind of thing. Uh, I guess I, I would say, should it be an aspect? And then if so, how, how do we communicate that? What do we do in proclaiming the gospel, the good news that includes uh, this hope for a life after life, after yes. death? Yes, I, I agree with you 100%, George. The preaching of the gospel is the preaching of the resurrection. It doesn't negate the death of Christ and all that it accomplished for us. But I think the resurrection... Um, you know, first of all, it's, we are confident about its historicity, and so we're on strong ground there. Um, secondly, uh, it's, its ontological significance and its significance uh, for our future, I, I think, uh, is, is, is all important, and I agree, we, we, need to, we need to preach it. We need to, um, I think it was that opening quote where, uh, oh, C.S. Lewis, preach Christian to preach Christianity means primarily to preach the resurrection. Uh, and we really do need to get back to that, I think, as the church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have an online question from uh, former faculty, Professor Emeritus Sven Soderlund, someone many of you in this room would, would know. So here's Sven's question. Uh, is it right to say that the strongest evidence for the resurrection is the transformation of the disciples? Did that transformation of life and witness not come about primarily through the work of the Spirit on Pentecost? Oh, thanks, Sven. Um, <laughs> Sven is the New Testament scholar who taught me Greek, so I think he's just he's getting back at me here. <laughs> no, no, Sven, that's a delightful question, but for me it's not an either or, it's both and. Um, it's true that until the Spirit shows up, they don't recognize the fullness of what has happened. Um, you know, the mystery of what happens between John 20 and Acts 2, where Jesus breathes on, the, on them the Holy Spirit. I think that's, that's, that might be a good metaphor for saying it's, it's both and. It's Jesus in their midst. And it's the Spirit who is imparted to them. Um, you know, I think this is a New Testament perspective. perspective. You know, there's... there's Two New Testament scholars sitting right in front of me here, so I say this in fear and trembling, but it seems to me the theology of the New Testament went this way. They got the resurrection, and then they understood the death, and then they understood the incarnation. That was the direction of the theology. Um, but was the role of the Spirit huge in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So both and, Sven, I think. Both and. We'll see what Sven thinks of, the, of, of that answer sometime. He'll be back. Um, uh, any other questions? From you folk. I've got one more. I've got a few more, but I don't want to um, delay us too much. There's an, is there another one? Okay. Here, I'll, I'll ask you mine while this other fine yeah. gentleman goes to the microphone. Um, I remember one time somebody asked me about whether it wouldn't have been better if Jesus had stayed longer on earth or was still on earth rather than ascending. So what's the relation between resurrection and ascension? Or yeah. in a sense, why is, resurrection, why, why is ascension important? given how magnificently important the resurrection is. Something is put on hold by the ascension. T.F. Torrance speaks about that as uh, it, it, the, the ascension enables the age of the spirit. Unless the, the sun ascends, the spirit does not come down. 
And the, 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 the age between Jesus' first coming and his second coming is an age of mission. It's an age of, of the gospel in that sense. Um, so, I, I mean, one can, I suppose, speculate about if Jesus had remained here on earth, wouldn't he have done better things? On the other hand, he was limited. He was a person in a, in a limited human body. The spirit is everywhere. And the growth, the growth of the Christian gospel between the first and the fourth centuries is phenomenal. Um, it's, uh, you know, from 500 uh, to, I forget the number, five, five, well, four, four to five million uh, by the end of the third century. So it's, it's the work of the Spirit is unhindered. Um, and in a sense, Christ is here because the Spirit makes the presence of Christ here to us in, in some very significant ways. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you. Very, very helpful. Up to this matter, microphone, Matt, Matt Lynch. Ross, thanks so much for your talk this evening. Um, I'm looking at this list of no's here, and uh, that's on the screen at the moment, no resurrection, no new creation. And, and thinking as an old, from an Old Testament perspective that um, f there was hope of resurrection of the body. There was a, a reaffirmation of creation post-flood, like the new creation happened there. Um, there was a grounding for ethics. So I'm wondering if you could just speak to the qualitative difference in the reaffirmation, for instance, of creation in the resurrection of Jesus that was not already present for the people of God. Hmm. So I, I, I have to believe that there's something special about the fullness of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Um, and, it, and, and not in any way to minimize the richness of the Old Testament, but, and there's a great continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament, which I fully and, and gladly agree. But I think, um, you know, the book of Hebrews starts with uh, God who in sundry times and in divers manners spake, on, uh, spake in times past unto the Father. That's the King James Version. That's what I grew up with. <laughs> Has in these last days spoken unto us in son. There is something climactic, I think, about the resurrection, about the revelation of Jesus, and including his resurrection. Um, death is not overcome in the Old Testament, I think. It may be anticipated, but in the New Testament, in the person of Christ. Um, and of course, the meaning of that is created in the Old Testament, so again, continuity, but I think there is um, something remarkable about a person who enters into death in a body and is resurrected in a body that says creation has been reaffirmed. Um, God has committed, God has shown himself to be committed to creation. Um, so yeah, I, I, those are, I, my answer is Christological. That's the only way I know to answer that one. Another question from this microphone over here. Sorry, I don't know if this might be a repeat of the question that Matt just asked, uh, so my apologies for that. But um, for once again, for the, the no list, one of the things was, you know, no grounding for Christian ethics. Um, but one of the things that was taught during New Testament by Rick Watts was talking about, like, for the Sermon on the Mount, it's not something new, but just re, um, like turning things upside down, just like re-explaining, like, okay, we're actually fulfilling the law and fulfilling um, what the Old Testament was talking about. So um, isn't Christianity itself also just kind of a continuation or fulfillment of Jewish ethics? And so how does the resurrection then alter that? But this might just be, once again, you'll just say it's Christological. Yeah. So. Yes, I think what's new about Christian ethics, um, I mean, this is a big subject, and maybe Theological Ethics, my book, would be helpful in, in answering this question, but I think there is no doubt in my mind, oh, it was uh, Klaus Bockmiel who was our great teacher of ethics here when I was a student, who used to say there is no new ethical material in the New Testament. There is no new ethical material in the, old, in the New Testament. But, and, and so that's backed up by the, by the fact that Jesus affirms the Decalogue in the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't create a new law in that sense. Um, but what is different, I think, is the power for ethics. That first of all, he gives us the norm for ethics in his own person. And secondly, he shows us uh, the grounding of ethics in his relationship with the Father and the Spirit. And thirdly, he shows us the power of ethics, uh, the New Testament does, as the Spirit present and available to us uh, in order to live the ethical life. So 
I don't know that the content of ethics is much different, but I think that the power for ethics is different. And it is, uh, yeah, and at the same time, I want to be careful how I say that, because, I mean, I, I, I read the Psalms every day, and the other day I, I read, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's so much gospel right there. So gospel's in the Old Testament, but I think ultimately the Old Testament is anticipating Jesus, and, and, the, and the New Testament expounds Jesus, and uh, it, uh, yeah, I'm perhaps, perhaps that's enough to say on that right now. Big and good question. Maybe our last question of the evening will be over here at this microphone. Hi, Ross. Um, so my question is, and it's still not well formulated yet, but um, so what does it mean that now, so you talked about how what it means for there to be a resurrected um, Christ who is both divine and human to be a high priest, but what does it mean for God, like the doctrine of God, that now there is like, so before he was incarnate, there was no like a physical human inside the triune God, but now there is a physical human inside the triune God, and like, I, that's still like kind of confusing to me, like, and, and yeah. what does, well, how does it work and what does it imply, I guess? I think it might be a revelation uh, to many people in our churches that there is a man in the Godhead, uh, and that he has a body, a real body, um, and at the same time he is fully God and fully human. I would want to draw the veil of mystery uh, over some of that, but the book of Hebrews, I think one of, its, uh, one of its tenets is that there is at the right hand of the Father a man, and uh, in, in chapter 2, that, that, that man uh, is the means of our salvation, and uh, in other chapters, that, that God-man, uh, Melchizedek, the Melchizedek, Melchizedek and high priest uh, at the right hand of the Father is able to sympathize with us and intercedes for us. Um, so, yes, there is a man in the glory, we might say, and uh, he is the God-man. Uh, you might want to read Karl Barth's book, The Humanity of God, to gain more insight into that. And uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Okay, friends. Now is our opportunity to thank Ross Hastings for a really stimulating evening. And in just a minute, around the corner at the bookstore, there are copies there available, and Ross would be glad to sign them. Every author delights in signing books. So uh, we'll see you at the book table in a few minutes. Thanks for being here tonight, and have a good evening.